It's just loading. Facebook was not working, so we're going live on YouTube instead. Um, but I will still do a little intro oh, yeah, sure, once yeah. it's set up. But okay, sorry everybody. So just loading. We've had to switch to YouTube. Facebook was having some trouble. Okay, everybody, we are up. So, gotta mute this. There we go. Okay, sorry about those technical difficulties. We are welcoming tonight to the museum. Dr. Terry Galway, who is speaking about uh, the Fire Department of New York about his book called So Others Might Live. So Dr. Galway is a senior editor at Politico. He's responsible for New York State political coverage out of Albany. He's been a journalist for more than 40 years. He's the author of more than a dozen books, including Machine Made, Tammany Hall, and the Creation of Modern American Politics. He's a member of the New York, was a member of the New York Times editorial board and was city editor of the New York Observer. He holds a PhD in US history from Rutgers. His talk tonight is about the history of the New York Fire Department from the original 18th century volunteer force to the New York firefighter unit in the, in, sorry, in the Union Army, from the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire to the arson epidemic of the 1970s and on to contemporary issues of diversity and efficiency. Terry's father, father-in-law, godfather, and uncles were all New York City firefighters and he tells the story of men, women, tragedies, and triumphs of the FDNY throughout its history as no one else could. So at the end, there's going to be a chance to ask questions. We're gonna be doing questions both live and virtually. So there might be a little bit of a pause or silence. So just hang tight with us while that happens. So I am going to get Terry all set up and then we will be ready to go. So I will get the slides oh, okay. back on. Right. Here's your microphone. Right. Okay, so great. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's it's not a particularly nice uh, day in Albany, but uh, as someone who you know li lives in New Jersey, like, every day is a nice day in Albany. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm in New Jersey. Uh, how I got there, I don't know, but it, uh, it's been years now. But uh, it's nice. It's uh, this is about my fifth time here, uh, or, or down at the old place. So it's always a delight to uh, to be here. Uh, you know. I come from a long line of firefighters, but I'm not one. Uh, you know, I, my memories of my father are uh, several times of him coming home after an overnight shift in particular, because the two shifts at the FDNY are 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then there's the dreaded 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. to 9 a.m. shift. And I remember a few times him coming home. I just looked my out. Uh, uh, but it turns out he worked on Staten Island. So he was wiped out, but it wasn't because of fires. I don't know what it was. I don't know what they would do with him in Staten Island. I mean, come on. Uh, but he actually, uh, he did have a few tough fires. And, um, it, and, and actually one of my other memories uh, was uh, he, he worked in a, a firehouse uh, engine company, 162 in Great Hills, which is actually where he grew up uh, and where I was born. It's a, you know, it's a typical suburban town now, but you know, in the 1960s, Staten Island to uh, somebody from Manhattan was the farm and, and you know, with good reason. Uh, but I do remember there was a big fire uh, on the North shore of Staten Island, which was more urban. It was an apartment house fire and it was a big deal. And he was detailed from Great Kills to Stapleton, which is where the fire was. The point of all this was, it was a big enough fire that there was a TV crew there. Milton Lewis of Channel 7 Eyewitness News was there. Like, wow. So we had to, of course, watch Channel 7 Eyewitness News with Bill Butel and Roger Grinsby that day. And it was funny because uh, Milton Lewis actually said, 
which is a rare piece of honesty, but also tells you something about television news, at least in, you know, 1971, that like if they had film, they were going to run it. It didn't, it didn't matter the news value, right? But I just remember him sort of with the microphone, uh, sorry, with the microphone here. And he said, this fire was not really that important or special, but, you know, the images of the hardworking firefighters, you know, remain, which is a, another way of saying, look, we got all this video, like we got to use it, right? Hey, we paid overtime for these cameramen. And sure enough, the shot was my father sitting down on, on the engine, on, on engine 162, kind of sitting on where the guys stand with his head down like this. And he's just so covered with smoke. And I thought, and like that was his moment of fame, right? I was, oh, he's famous now. He's on Channel 7 Eyewitness News. But it also told me like this, yeah, this was just an ordinary fire, no big deal. And he looked exhausted. Right. He had had, now he was a little older for a firefighter back then. He was in his 40s. Uh, but, you know, he had to go into a building. There, like, there were no dramatic rescues. It was just a fire. And there he was, probably as more tired than I've ever been. Right. Uh, perhaps not as filthy as I've ever been because I, you know, I been softball, baseball, I used to dive around, but he was pretty tired. Uh, and maybe that was the moment when I decided I wasn't going to be a firefighter. Uh, I'd be a journalist because who gets dirty and tired as a journalist? Um, so, but needless to say, I've had a tremendous respect for firefighters uh, as a result of my family connections. Uh, I was working on the idea of a, of a history of the fire department of New York before 9-11. Uh, and of course, once 9-11 happened, that was a book that needed to be done, right? So one of the interesting things about the cover, oh, that's no longer the cover of my book. No, that's fine. No, no, no. Okay. One of the interesting things about that's the cover of my book, a real fire buff would tell you that's not a fire department of New York firefighter because he's got a face shield. And they, I mean, maybe they use them now, but in 2001, they didn't use face shields. In fact, one of the things about the fire department of New York is that they're always the last to innovate. The, the FDNY was the last to give up um, horses. You know, they, they would they uh, my father never had these, you know, air things and masks like they just went in like, OK, the building's on fire. I'll just go in. They didn't put on a mask. They didn't put on, a, a, you know, air oxygen. I mean, maybe some of the guys on the hooking uh, the, uh, the uh, trucks, the uh, ladder companies, maybe they did, but he was an engine company person. And there's a real division of labor between an engine company person and a ladder company. You, one of the divisions being the ladder company people are generally bigger and the engine company people are somewhat smaller. Uh, but, you know, so the fire FDNY is absolutely known for resisting technological change uh, that may have changed now that we're in the 21st century. I hope so. But, um, but, but that image, and, and I can't tell you when that book came out in 2002 uh, and Mayor Mike Bloomberg gave me a nice uh, book party at the Fire Museum um, downtown Manhattan. Uh, but I can't tell you how many firefighters came up to me that night and said, hey, What's the deal with the cover? Uh, not to not to imitate firefighters, right? But basically, it's like, what's the deal with the cover? You know, that's not one of us. I said, I know. Okay, I didn't see it till it was too late. But but that is not one of them. It's somebody else. But you get the idea, right? You, you maybe wouldn't want to be there with all the fire in the background. It was a very dramatic picture. But one of the things that I I do want to uh, talk specifically about today, uh, given the location of where we are uh, is the Irish uh, component of the FDMY. I mean, obviously you can't tell the history of the fire department of New York without telling the history of the Irish and vice versa, right? Um, it's uh, even to this day, you know, the FDMY is uh, perhaps not as diverse as it should be. Some people would say uh, it's certainly not as diverse as the police department. Uh, I don't know why that is. Uh, it's, it's certainly a topic of debate, uh, but 
one thing is certain, you know, the Irish traditions of the FDNY are still very much present as this picture from the St. Patrick's Day party, a St. Patrick's Day parade back in the days before we had COVID uh, shows, right? I mean, I've seen a million uh, people like that at the uh, St. Patrick's Day party at the St. Patrick's Day Parade rather on Fifth Avenue in New York. And here in Albany, uh, you know, I, I confess, I don't know uh, as much as maybe I should about the Albany Fire Department, but I suspect that there is a strong Irish tradition. And, you know, even at the police department as diverse as it is, as it is you know, today, if there is a uh, death in the police department, whether on duty or not, uh, chances are there'll be bagpipes at the funeral, right? I mean, and that, that they, there you are. There, there's our Irish tradition in the in the public in the police department as well as the FDNY. So, I, one of the things I tried to do in the book is is the book is a history of the fire department. It actually, some of the reviewers pointed out that it's actually a history of New York told through fires, and that's kind of what I was trying to do. You know, I, I tell the story of the fire, the great fire. There's, there's several great fires in New York history. Uh, one of them occurred in 1776 when the British left, uh, the British left New York, or rather the Americans left New York, uh, George Washington and Nathaniel Green abandoned New York in 1776 after, the, uh, after they lost the Battle of Brooklyn. Uh, and sure enough, you know, as they're retreating up Manhattan, uh, there's a huge fire in Manhattan that burns down about a quarter of the city in 1776. To this day, nobody knows who started the fire. George Washington supposedly said, I don't know who did it, but I think some good fellow did, right? Something to that effect. In other words, as the Americans left New York and went over to God forbid, New Jersey for the march down to Trenton and Princeton, uh, the, the British are now left to deal with this huge fire. So that was one fire. There was a, another huge fire in 1834 that burned a quarter of the city. So I tell all those stories in the book, but I think, you know, for our purposes tonight, the story really begins with what it was about firefighting and the Irish, why there was such, why it was such an appeal, not just in New York, here in Albany, in Boston, anywhere the Irish went, uh, there, they established a presence, not just in the fire departments, but also in the police departments. And I, you know, I've thought about it a lot. You know, I've thought about my father's advice to me when I was 18 and I was going off to, I, wasn't, I didn't go off to college, I commuted to college, but I was going to college. And, you know, he pointed out to me in 1973 that if I took the firefighters test, which I think he really did want me to do, uh, that he said two things, two things. One, I would never get laid off. And two, I'd have a pension after 20 years. Um, I am about to turn 66 years old. I have a 401k, but uh, a pension would have been better, uh, particularly one that I started cashing 20 years ago. Um, and, but as it turned out, ironically enough, I probably would have gotten laid off because those of you who know the history of New York know that in the 1970s, New York had the first layoffs in its history of firefighters. Now they eventually were all hired back, but I knew guys my, and they were all men back then. I knew guys my age who had gone into the fire uh, department in 1974, who were laid off in 75, 76. Again, eventually hired back, but, um, but that was the appeal. Security, right? That was the appeal, which leads me to what the Irish left behind when they came here, right? Most of our ancestors, those of you who are Irish Americans, and I think this, this is something of a universal story, but particularly to Irish America, you think about who they were and what they were leaving behind. Uh, they had the uncertainty of tenant farming, right? Most of our ancestors were tenant farmers. They didn't own, own their own land, right? They were subject to the whims of the landlord, and they were certainly subject to the whims of the weather right? There was no certainty in their lives. So there was that. Obviously, no opportunity either. I mean, I defy anyone to tell me that their ancestor, uh, their great, great, great grandfather, you know, was born into a tenant farm and became rich. That story doesn't exist, right? In Ireland, it just doesn't. Uh, they came rich when they came here, maybe, right? So poverty too, right? I mean, all of the great, uh, 
you know, the great histories that are being written about Ireland today by people like Christine Keneally, who teaches at Quinnipiac in Connecticut, who's, you know, a terrific scholar of the Irish famine, which we'll get to in a second, uh, but also Cormac O'Grata and others, uh, Joe Lee, who used to be at NYU, Kevin Kenny, who's now at NYU, was at Boston College. I read a lot of their, uh, their scholarship. You know, the, the picture that many of them paint of Ireland in the... <laughs> you know, in the, eight, in the 1700s and 1800s, it's not pretty, right? A very rural place uh, where majority, the Catholic majority was oppressed, had their land stolen, uh, and basically, again, lived at the whim, at the whim of the market, at the whim of the landlord, and the whim of the weather. So a great deal of insecurity is built into their lives. So that's who they are in Ireland, right? Then they come here and firefighting in particular police department, maybe too, but firefighting is a way up the ladder, literally. Yeah, you see what I did there? It's a ladder, right? Okay. Uh, but also the economic ladder as well, right? Oh, sorry. There we are. Uh, so, but, it, but at first it wasn't even the idea of a pension and a, uh, 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 you know, paid vacation, and everything else. Firefighting back then in the 1830s, 1840s uh, is volunteer in New York. So like why, so what's the appeal there? Why do we see I, the Irish going into volunteer firefighting? Well, one of the reasons is, you know, uh, because they were heroes, these firefighters, right? They, this is a later picture, but you get the idea, right? They're coming through the streets in their white horses, white horses, right? Uh, and they're, you know, they're on their way to a fire in the same way that even today, when we see a fire truck behind us, we pull over and those of us who are religious might say a prayer because you never know where those firefighters are going and what it's gonna lead to. So they were, uh, they were looked upon as heroes. And a lot of the fire companies were connected to political clubs and gangs, sometimes the same, right? Uh, and one of them, one of the great fire companies of the volunteer era was engine company number six, which was led by a guy named Bill Tweed who we would know today as Boss Tweed, right? And the symbol of engine six was a tiger which became the symbol of Tammany Hall. Today, even not that Tammany Hall exists anymore, but if you do any, look at any history of Tammany Hall, it's always the Tammany Tiger. Well, where did the tiger come from? It came from the volunteer firefighters. It came from engine company number six. So if you're, now we're talking about the Irish immigrants of the 1820s and the 1830s and early 1840s. If they're looking for, and again, we're mostly talking about men. We're not mostly, we are talking exclusively about men here. You know, they want to get involved in politics because they learn politics from Daniel O'Connell in Ireland. They learn the power of how to organize from Daniel O'Connell. Uh, so, well, where can we go to organize here? The church is one place and the firehouse is the other, right? And it's, it was, again, because it's volunteer, basically anybody can go, right? There's no test, right? Uh, you go and all of a sudden you're friends with Bill Tweed and he's going places. <laughs> One of the places was to jail, uh, right? But what, but what changes everything is the, um, so you're changing that, right? Oh, and so I have to change that. There we are. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. But what changes everything is the famine, right? It changes everything about the United States. It changes everything about Ireland. And it certainly changes the fire department, right? The great hunger from 1845, people have various dates. I tend to date it from the time of the first potato failure until the potato is completely returned. So 1845 to 1852, not that I'm a scholar of the famine, but that, those are the dates that I use. Right now, you see this mass migration of Irish Irish to New York, to Boston, to Canada, uh, to the point where you know, I mean, famously, you know, Ireland in 1840 in the 1840 census had eight million people. By the time of the 1850 census, you know, it was down to five. And to this day, the whole of Ireland, including Northern Ireland, still does not have as many people as it had in 1850, uh, rather in 1840, 
Why is that? Because of the famine. That is a famine memorial in Dublin, by the way. That's what that picture is from. And, you know, what are those people fleeing? They're fleeing starvation. They're fleeing insecurity. They're fleeing poverty. Everything betrayed them. Everything, except for the church, you know, and even then some people have said the church might have been able to do more, et cetera, but everything betrayed them. And they left hungry and scared and just hoping for something better. But it seems to me one of the things, and I have no idea, you know, we don't have a whole lot of firsthand evidence from people who, who survived the famine, certainly contemporaneously. So we historians sort of have to try to read their minds. It's, and it's sort of the same thing that historians are doing with slavery today in the United States. There's not a whole lot of firsthand accounts of slavery. So we try to use our imagination to figure out what these people were thinking, why they did what they did. And in the case of uh, the famine Irish, I think one thing is clear. They never farmed again, right? Most of the Irish who left, they came to New York and they came to Albany and they came to Boston and they became urban people. These people who many of whom had never been in a city before until maybe they left, uh, you know, it was, many of them had to go to uh, Southampton first in England, but so many of them from the West of Ireland who, you know, maybe went to Galway or Cork on occasion, but maybe not. And now all of a sudden they're in Boston and New York, two of the fastest growing cities in the world, particularly New York. And they become these quintessential urban people. They become Jimmy Cagney, right? That's who they eventually become. They, they will never let the land betray them again. And while it's certainly not perhaps even polite anymore to quote from a movie like Gone with the Wind, and I totally understand that. But those of you who remember that movie, as I do, uh, will know, of course, that the key character in Gone with the Wind is Scarlett O'Hara, who is the daughter of Irish immigrants living in the South and owning slaves. I don't think there were a whole lot of people like that back then. <laughs> Rich Irish Catholics living in Georgia and owning slaves. But, but anyway, the O'Hara's apparently struck it rich somehow. I don't know how. And, and you know, but at the, at the, the last scene before the intermission, Scarlett O'Hara returns to her ancestral home of Tara. And uh, of course she's starved. She gets, and of course the, the place has been raided by union soldiers who of course in Gone with the Wind, they're evil union. Uh, so uh, it's been raided and, and uh, she's starved and she goes out to uh, the farm and she's digging up something and she, gets it and tries to eat it. And of course it's spoiled and she wretches and then she turns up to the guy upstairs or woman upstairs, whoever, and says, as God is my witness, I will never be hungry again. If I have to steal, murder, rob, whatever, I will never be hungry again. Now, I'm not sure that Martha Mitchell, not Martha Mitchell, <laughs> she's a figure from the Nixon years. Uh, <laughs> Ma Margaret Mitchell, yes. You know, when you get to be my age, they're all the same. Uh, when Margaret Mitchell wrote that novel, I don't know whether she had the famine in mind, but I have to tell you, if ever there was something on the minds of those people in those coffin ships going across the Atlantic in 1847, that's what was on their mind. They would never be hungry again, no matter what they had to do. And not to venture into one of my other books, but I feel that that is how you can explain Tammany Hall too. And maybe how you could explain the Albany machine, right? They will never be hungry again. And what Bill Kennedy said uh, that the one great sin in Albany when he was a kid was hunger. Like he just, he, he, that was the one terrible thing that you feared was hunger. So, you know, it's built into our bones uh, and uh, maybe it's starting to leave and maybe that's good, maybe it's bad, but it was there for the long time so I think that's how, I think we have to understand that part of, of the Irish experience as well. So in my book, I talk about a couple of heroes, Irish American heroes, Irish immigrant heroes, in fact, uh, from this period after the famine. 
And before we get to John Bresnan, I should point out that uh, New York, again, continued to have a volunteer fire, uh, fire force, a fire department, until after the Civil War, when it's decided that the time has come for a professional department. And this is one of the first professional firefighters, right? He was, he, uh, his, John Bresnan's family left Ireland just before the famine, and he settles in the Five Points, or the, this area uh, called the Bloody Old Sixth. The, the sixth ward of Manhattan, right? He's in the, you know, he's just, I mean, he's a walking stereotype. He's a pre-famine immigrant. He serves in the Union Army. He is appointed to the Metropolitan Fire Department in 1865. That is the precursor to the FDNY, right? He becomes a deputy chief. He's, you know, he is a success. Here is the mobility that the Irish didn't have in Ireland, right? He's dirt poor when he gets here. By the time he's in early middle age, he's a deputy chief. He's, he gets married and his wife dies uh, and he raises three children. And back then, if you were a chief or a deputy chief, you lived at the firehouse. I mean, my father lived at the firehouse on his overnight shifts. Right? They really lived in the firehouse. That was his place, right? Uh, he was brave. He, you know, uh, newspapers are really just starting to cover daily events now because they, the technology is improving and they can send reporters to fires. And John Bresnan is a sort of folk hero in New York right, for his rescues, right? But one of the things, he grew up in a tenement once he moved to Ireland, he grew up in a tenement. And one of the things that struck him is that, you know, these tenements were fire traps. And not only were these people you know, his people in these tenements, but also his people were going into the tenements to put out these atrocious fires, right? So one of the things he gets involved in is fire codes, imagine that, and telling people who own private property, no, 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 you're not gonna do it this way because that way starts fires. I don't, yes, it's private property, I'm sorry, but we have to establish certain codes. So he's very scientific in that regard. Um, and, you know, it's an Irish story, because so it has to have a sad ending, but he died in a fire. I interviewed his grandson, Bill Bresnan, who uh, had retired just before 9-11. And in my book, Bill Bresnan is one of the first people I write about because I knew I could take his story back. And Bill talks about, he was pissed off that he didn't get promoted, right? I, I, you know, it wasn't a matter of political connections because you don't do that anymore. I guess he just didn't do well on the test or whatever. But if I remember correctly, and I'm trying to remember a 20 year old story, I know he was a little annoyed. And he said, basically, yeah, that's it. I give up, right? I'm not going to, I'm gonna retire, right? Um, and he tells a story that he had just retired at 9-11 and what it was like to watch as a, as a newly retired firefighter, what it was like to watch what was happening on 9-11. And yeah, and knowing in, in his memory that his father had died, a grandfather rather, had died in a fire. So it was uh, very moving to talk to Bill. Uh, he's also an artist, a very interesting guy. I unfortunately lost touch with him, but, um, but it also shows you that family connection that, that is so true. And I think that ex further explains the persistence of the Irish in the fire department of New York, because it's a family tradition. I know we all know about blue bloods and family tradition in, in not blue buds as in like the Brahmins of Massachusetts. I was talking about blue buds, the television show, which my mother watches with Tom Selleck, uh, right? Uh, but that there's family traditions in the NYPD, but I think they're really stronger. I could be wrong, but I think they're really stronger in the fire department of New York because I've never, I've never met an unhappy firefighter. I've met a lot of unhappy cops. You know, I mean, it's the nature of the job, right? So anyway, Bresnan is one character I write about and Hugh Bonner, his friend, these two guys become friends. Hugh Bonner actually is a famine immigrant. He moves into the five points as well. I forget how they get to know each other. I think they, they get to know each other in the fire department. He uh, joined as a young man, he becomes the chief of department and he too is a professional. He starts a school of instruction. He basically says, we can't just take, with all due respect to the guys on the street, we just can't take guys on the street and put them in the firehouse. We actually have to teach them how to put out fires. I mean, you know, kind of basic knowledge, right? You want to be a journalist? You maybe should write. Well, I think we've 
maybe could do a better job with that. But firefighters, right, they have to learn how to put out a fire, right? So by uh, rather 1888, there's a typo that obviously I <clears throat> did. Uh, by 1888, uh, by the way, this gives you an idea. I went to the fire museum in New York and I found a roster of all of the firefighters on the payroll in 1888. And I counted, I went through each one. And of course, I'm not good in math. So I say about a thousand because it could have been a thousand four. It could have been 998, but after a while, you know, you just, uh, how many am I at, right? This is before calculators and phones and things like that, doing it on right. So I concluded, so first of all, without doubt, 284 of the thousand firefighters in New York in 1888 were born in Ireland. So that's a pretty good percentage. And then I counted all of the Irish names, which, you know, is not really scientific, right? But I mean, you know, if your name is O'Shaughnessy, there's got to be a little hole in there, right? I didn't count the Smiths, right? I didn't count the Joneses, right? I said, okay, they, they might be those others, right? So I just counted those with, with clear Irish names. And of that 750 of the thousand firefighters in New York had Irish last names that, you know, and it might be more, right? Because Smith could be an Irish name. Uh, Bonner was uh, one of the people too, along with his friend, John Bresnan, who uh, worked uh, at trying to make tenements uh, more safe and, and livable. And one of the things that I really admire, and I, I was gonna read a section from the book about Hugh Bonner and John Bresnan, but I, I, I won't because it's boring. I mean, the words are great, but I'm boring. So when I read, so, uh, but take my word. So these two heroic New York firefighters, both natives of Ireland, both grow up in the tenements, grow up poor. And with their professionalism and their sense of memory, they remembered what it was like to be poor. They remembered what it was like to grow up in the tenements and they made it a mission of theirs to do as best as they can to make sure that these new people in tenements, some of them Irish, some of them not, uh, would be better protected from the curse of fire than, than they themselves were. I mean, they, they, as children, they didn't have to deal with fire, but they understood how, how vulnerable the poor were to fires. And, and so there's, there's a whole uh, section in my book about uh, this committee called the Tenement House Committee, which is founded by well-meaning wasps to try to, you know, alleviate the condition of the poor in New York. And the, the two people they consult, these high-born wasps, the two people they consult are Hugh Bonner and John Bresnan, right? Uh, and in fact, when John Bresnan died uh, in the fire, the tenement house committee just was uh, distraught, you know, and it was, I think it was good for the Irish too, because for the Irish image in New York, these were not the fighting Irish, not that there's anything wrong with that, right, or their team, right, uh, these were not maybe what you would call stereotypical Irish Americans, or maybe you would, because they were courageous, and they were willing to speak truth to power. They were willing to tell the city hall, which is controlled by the Irish at that point, pretty much, that look, we, we have to do something about fire safety. And don't tell us that private property can't be infringed upon because it can. Otherwise people will die, including our firefighters. And sure enough, to this day, one of the FDI, uh, FDNY's top prizes for bravery is named in Hugh Bonner. So what I also like about the fire department, and this might be true of the police department in New York as well, might be true of the fire department in Albany and other places, is they do have a sense of history. Like history, you know, the, the department was not formed yesterday. There were people who, who made it what it is today. So another important milestone that has an Irish connection is the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire which uh, hopefully, you know, most people have heard of. It happened in March of 1911. I mean, there's no discernible Irish connection in the sense that none of the victims were Irish. Most of them were more than 140, uh, more than 140, I think act precisely 146, mostly young women. I think uh, uh, 10 men may have died, but, but the rest were women. Most of them uh, Jewish women, Italian, 
women, most of them younger than 25, working in the shirt waist, uh, this shirt factory, textile factory on the ninth floor of what was called the Ash Building. Ironically enough, the Ash Building, the fire breaks out. The building's still there in Greenwich Village, by the way, on the NYU campus. Uh, and, you know, the fire was over in half an hour, but 144 people, 146 people died, right? Uh, at the scene of the fire, there are these great newspaper accounts of a guy called Edward Croker. Croker was the fire chief of the department, like the number one guy below, right below the commissioner, the, you know, the, the, the highest uniform rank. Croker happened to be the nephew of Richard Croker, who was the boss of Tammany Hall. So he wasn't taken seriously because everybody thought, oh, Uncle Richard got you that job, which may have been possibly true. But everything about uh, uh, Croker, uh, Edward Croker's career says, OK, this guy, <laughs> maybe he got some help from his Tammany Hall boss uncle. But this was one brave dude, again, known for his rescues, known for his professionalism, and he was at the site, so that's the ash building over on the left, that's the Triangle Shirtwaist fires up there on the ninth floor, that's what's left. He's, he is actually giving interviews to, to reporters on the street saying, basically, I, I've been telling people this was gonna happen. This, I, I, I've been, why can't we get sprinklers in these buildings? I told the real estate board we needed to get more sprinklers, and this is what happened. You know, he's sort of like, you know, the prophet Jeremiah, just sort of saying, you know, I said this was going to happen, right? And he was absolutely right. Now, you know, like Croker's uh, history at the FDNY, a lot of it is, is colored by the fact that his, you know, his uncle was a relatively corrupt Tammany boss. I feel he's sort of one of the underrated heroes of the fire department, mainly because of his calling out the commercial real estate industry in New York, which believe it or not, has a lot of power even today. Uh, and saying, you know, this is your fault. You know, this is what you have brought on. Uh, and then the other sort of Irish connection, which relates to uh, the building up the street, uh, the state capitol, is uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist fire mobilized public opinion, but particularly a guy named Al Smith who at that point is a high ranking uh, assembly person. I don't think he's speaker yet. No, he's not, uh, but he might be majority leader. Uh, and he and his friend, Robert Wagner, uh, an immigrant from Germany, who is the president of the state Senate, they are named by the Tammany Hall boss, Charles Murphy, uh, to investigate the fire. And, you know, I mean, you can't pick up a history of the United States even today without a mention of the work that they did. They may not mention Al Smith or Robert Wagner, but the Triangle Shirtwaist, uh, the Triangle Fire Commission is one of the great landmarks of American history because as Wagner and Smith realized, it wasn't just about fire. It was about the conditions that the people, mostly poor people, immigrant people were working on there. And, and so they expanded their commission to include not just people who worked in a, in a factory like that, but to people who, who worked on the farms. Uh, upstate. And you had Al Smith, this guy from the Lower low East Side, you know, who once said, I don't really get above 14th Street that often, right? Well, all of a sudden, he's in central New York, looking at farms and seeing the way these, uh, particularly people in the canning factories, because they would take the produce and can them and send them uh, on their way. Uh, and, you know, his this is a, a landmark for American history. It's a landmark for Al Smith, too, because this is when he becomes Al Smith. This is when he becomes a defender of the poor. You know, he doesn't have a whole lot of ideology. It's not like he's reading Karl Marx on the side. You know, he's actually reading legislation. Uh, and he is, you know, becoming, he remembered who he was. Now, some people would say Al Smith sort of forgot who he was in the 30s once he started making a lot of money and he moved up to Park Avenue, and uh, rather Fifth Avenue. And there's probably some truth in that. But Al Smith, you know, even before, but certainly once the Triangle Shirtwaist fire happens, Al Smith becomes the voice of outrage up, up State Street in the Capitol. Uh, and as a result, by 1913, there is a revolution of legislation uh, 
passed by a Tammany Hall controlled legislature with the approval of a Tammany boss named Charles Francis Murphy, whose father was a famine immigrant. And this is how I interpret the famine experience, which I really believe is so foundational to our experience here in America. We don't know about what our ancestors, we don't know a whole lot about our, about our ancestors, uh, those of us who can trace our roots that far, which frankly probably aren't a whole lot of us anyway. But I do believe that the famine Irish and their children and grandchildren remembered the legacy of starvation and deprivation in ways that, that uh, we can quantify. And, and one of the ways I believe is that you had in 1911 to 19, well, you had Charles Francis Murphy as the boss of Tammany Hall from 1902 to the time he died, 1903 to the time he died, 1924. And during that time, Tammany Hall passed remarkable social insurance legislation, the beginnings of minimum wage, unemployment compensation, workers' compensation, all of these things. I believe there's absolutely no proof of this, which is always the best theory at all, because I can just say it. Uh, but I do believe that that comes out of the Irish famine experience. Uh, so after, you know, later on, this man is not Irish. I just want to point it out. That's Fiero LaGuardia, <laughs> all right? But the reason I, first of all, LaGuardia was quite a character. He also might be the subject of my next book, but that's for two years from now when I'm up here talking about an Italian-American, <laughs> um, hopefully. Uh, but, you know, LaGuardia was a fire buff. I mean, LaGuardia used to get up. He, I guess he lived in Gracie Mansion. I, I don't know that for sure. But he used to get, get up in the middle of the night and go to a fire because he loved it, right? And that was him. That's a picture of him after fire. He had his own helmet, right? I mean, uh, imagine Bill de Blasio, <laughs> fire helmet. I, I mean, you know, it's hard to picture, uh, but not this guy. But during his period, the fire department grew in leaps and bounds, right? So as I say here, the, uh, the FDNY grows from 8,600 to 12,500 in just a year and a half. That's the concern. Now, the city is growing, too. And LaGuardia being the friend of FDR, even though one's a Republican, the other's a Democrat, New York City is getting a lot of WPA. Well, WPA may have been done by then they get we're getting a lot of federal money you know because back in the day it was good to have a president from your home state that may have changed a little bit recently but back then <laughs> back then you really was that's great you know and, and you got benefits right right so frank and roosevelt took care of new york i mean there's no question about that uh and i think that is what helped laguardia pay for all these firefighters. And, and, and as a result, you had a new generation. And now firefighting is not just, you know, it's not only just giving you security, it's not just giving you benefits, it's a, it's a ladder to the middle class, right? Now all of a sudden firefighters, the children of firefighters are, are you know, going to Regis, well, Regis was free, that's not a good example. Power Memorial, Xavier, right? They're going to those sorts of schools. Uh, Monsignor Farrell, where I am from, Staten Island. Uh, so it's, it's, the job is creating a new sort of middle class in New York, right? And, and, and people are, uh, you know, living a life in Woodside that they might not have ever imagined, right? And so when that generation of firefighters from the depression era, and let's not re let's remember too, 1938, 1939, the depression is still going on, right? Uh, so now these firefighters have a job from which they will not get laid off and they will retire in 20 years. And after 20 years in the 1950s, there's this amazing, I mean, you know, it's all uh, documented. There's this complete turnover of the fire department in the late 1950s because the guys, and again, I apologize for using the word guys, but it is all men. It's an all male department. Uh, so these guys uh, retire and now a new generation is taking their place. And sure enough, they walk into what was the worst period in FDNY history, the 1970s, which any firefighter, including my father, uh, would always refer to as the war years. Now, you know, my father was on Staten Island, not really the sort of fulcrum of the war, but uh, he was detailed enough times to Manhattan or the Bronx because they couldn't keep up with it, 
the firefighters. Remember, the 70s are a bad time for firefighters too. They're the first layoffs in FDNY and hope and let's hope the last layoffs in FDNY history, right? Uh, I found this statistic the other day. There, are two, there were 289 census tracts in the Bronx in the 70s. 44 of them had more than half their buildings burned to the ground. That's how bad it was. You know, we all remember, or at least some of us might remember the phrase, the Bronx is burning, which Howard Cosell supposedly said when there was a fire burning behind, uh, out beyond center field in Yankee Stadium in either the 77 or the 78 World Series. Later research has shown that Howard Cosell actually never said that. So how do these urban legends start, right? And in his, bio, in his autobiography, Howard Cosell actually said, yeah, I said that. But ESPN recently did, a, recently did a, a, a documentary called The Bronx is Burning. And they said, yeah, you didn't say it. We watched the tape of the movie. Uh, we watched the tape of the game. You never said it. How does that happen? It makes you not want to trust journalists. Oh, but, but, <laughs> I, I didn't say that. Uh, but anyway, the Bronx was burning, right? City lays off firefighters. There was a strike. The FDNY went on strike in 1973. I remember my father being torn because he was a good member of the United Firefighters Association. The union voted to strike. He was against it. I remember him going in his plain clothes to his firehouse because I think if there was a if there was an alarm, I think he was going to get on that truck. You know, he was maybe going to be a scab because he just felt it wasn't right. Well, his instincts were correct, by the way. The vote of the UFA, and this came out years later, uh, the head of the UFA, the United Firefighters Association, uh, rigged the election and said that the, the union members had voted in favor of a strike when in fact they had not. And the, the, the head of the association, a guy named Richard Bazzini, I think he might've gone to prison. Uh, he certainly was indicted for that. That is not, legal, uh, but, it, but it confirmed my stereotype. And my father was convinced because, because of the commitment of firefighters to public safety, he was convinced that there was something wrong about that vote, that firefighters would just, they might be dissatisfied, but they would never vote to strike. And he was right. Uh, the reason I mentioned Marty Selleck, uh, he is one of dozens of firefighters who died in the 1970s. Uh, he was a Staten Islander. He was someone I sort of knew of. And, you know, again, because this is an Irish story, there's always a sad ending. Uh, Marty Selleck died in an arson fire in 1977, and his brother died on 9-11. You know, he was in, he wasn't, I, I don't believe he was a firefighter. He was not. He just happened to be in one of the buildings. But on Staten Island, where I'm from, you know, the Selleck brothers are still remembered to this day because of tragic FDNY related, you know, uh, Marty being a, an FDI, uh, uh, FDNY member and Tom being involved in 9-11, which does take me to 9-11, right? There are many enduring images of 9-11, of, uh, uh, including the famous photo of the firefighters raising the flag, which of course, I, I don't mean to make light of a terrible situation, but, you know, that photo is so copyrighted that I couldn't get a copy of it, you know, but we all have it in our head, right? And, and by the way, if I was the photographer who took that picture, I wouldn't want me stealing it either, right? Uh, but we remember that picture. This is just sort of symbolic of what we saw that day, right? 343 firefighters. Number one, the first victim of the fire uh, of 9-11 was Father Michael Judge, Irish American chaplain of the FDNY. I met him once. I was blown away by the guy. I mean, he was so charming and dedicated to the firefighters, just dedicated to the FDNY. And what I, uh, I opened my book with this scene, uh, which somebody had slipped to me, I didn't know it. On September 10th, Father Judge said mass at a new firehouse in the Bronx, which also speaks to the Catholic, you know, we say the Irish traditions of the FDNY, I mean, they're also, yeah, they're Irish Catholic traditions, let's face it. Uh, the idea of saying mass in a firehouse that's being dedicated, uh, you know, 20 years later almost seems like, was that allowed? Yeah, of course it was allowed and it happened. And so Father Judge gave his sermon, gave his homily 
on the floor of the firehouse on September 10th. And he literally, he's talking about the job of firefighting. And he says, you have no idea when you get on that rig, you have no idea what God's calling you to do. He'll take care of you and you'll have a good life. That's literally less than 24 hours after Father Judge and 300, I guess Father Judge is considered one of those 343. Uh, so Father Judge and 342 of his colleagues were killed on 9-11. And that too is a famous photograph of Father Judge being taken out. He died of a heart attack, it's thought. Like he died of quote unquote natural causes. Uh, there was a film, of course, there have been many films about 9-11. There was one by a French director or French film who happened to be in one of the towers, which was the command post. Uh, so it would have been the second tower. To, you know, time plays tricks with all of us. I don't remember which one of the two towers went down first, but the command center was in the other one. Uh, Father Judge is there, and you see this, this French filmmaker is, is taking you know, film of documenting what's happening as it's happening. And you can see Father Judge, he's walking back and forth, clearly murmuring prayers, right? And, and Pete Gancy, the chief of department is there. And, you know, these people literally have minutes to live. I don't know how the film crew actually survived. I guess they must have left. They probably were told to leave. That's my guess. But I'll never forget watching that film of, of Father Judge uh, as, as, you know, as he's realizing this is this is a catastrophe, um, and it was right. And it, it, more than three thousand people killed, uh, three hundred forty-three members. You know who know. In some ways, I don't care how many Irish Americans there were. It doesn't matter, right? They were Americans. Some of them immigrants. Some of them not. Some of them, you know, most of them maybe were Irish. Doesn't matter, right? They were our neighbors. They were our friends. They were our protectors. Uh, however, you know. During that, th those funerals and afterwards, you know, we were constantly reminded by the bagpipers and, and you know, the people who turned out and, you know, of the, of the Irish legacy in the department, right? It was, a, uh, it was a reminder of all the sacrifice and all of the dedication to service that had come before. And Ray Downey, uh, Deputy Chief uh, for Special Operations, he was probably the most famous firefighter who died, or one of the most famous anyway, uh, known for his rescues, known for his special ops. Uh, there were many others as well. Um, and to show the resonance of the Irish tradition in firefighting, this is a picture of a garden of, of remembrance in County Cork of the FDNY, right? 343. The, the Garden of Remembrance doesn't ask how many were Irish because it doesn't matter, right? They were, um, these 343 people were representing the best of the FDNY, the best of the traditions. And, you know, so many of those traditions were established by the Irish. But one of my favorite stories, and this is how I'll close it, uh, is from not an Irishman. Oh, did it, uh, there we go. So, Captain Vinny Julius was a guy who I was told I really needed to interview for my story, for my book. And I called him up, he was retired. And he and his brother, Reggie Julius, who was a battalion chief, I think he was the first African-American to make battalion chief. And I called both of them and I said, listen, you know, I'm, I'm told, I'm sorry that I don't know your story. I'm writing a history of the fire department in New York and I'm told I really, I really ought to interview you. And Vinny Julius lived in Teaneck, which is a city in New Jersey, it's 20 miles from me. And he said, well, where do you live? And I said, well, I live in Maplewood, it's near South Orange. And Vinny Julius says, South Orange. Oh, that's where Crying's Irish pub is, right? I said, well, yeah, that's where I hang out. He goes, okay, well, me and my brother will come down and we'll have some Guinness. Okay. <laughs> Why not? And I, I, hope I, I hope I still have the tape, because back then, right, tape recorders, of my interview with Reggie and Vinny. I know I ran out of tape because it went on that long. <laughs> And I forget which one of them drive, was driving, but I know the other one had enough Guinness that would make some of us proud. <laughs> um, but the stories they told were unbelievable. And by the way, the stories they told were very honest. 
I mean, Reggie Julius, who was a, who was a big guy, told stories of having to basically, uh, finally he was being tormented in the 50s as one of the few black firefighters, took, told this Irish guy, okay, let's settle it right now. And they moved the rigs out of the, out of the firehouse and, and they settled it on the floor. And from what I understand, of course, he's telling the story, uh, Reggie Julius basically beat the crap out of this Irish guy who was bothering him, right? And they never got bothered again. And, uh, but Vinny's, uh, and both of them are dead now, sadly. Uh, but uh, Vinny has the last word in my book. And I think it stands for every Irish firefighter or any firefighter. He said at that point, I'm 75 years old. I've had a good life and a good career. I could die tomorrow, but if I do, I'm coming back as a firefighter for the city of New York, right? And that African-American man who had to struggle, you know, to get where he had to go, struggle in ways that many of us will never know. And sometimes struggling against people who look like us. And there he was, he was such a happy retired firefighter. Not happy because he was retired. He was happy to have done this service for the people of New York uh, and, and to have you know made a life for himself because of the fire department of New York. And I tell you, those two characters were, were remarkable because of their surprising nature, remarkable because of their good cheer. And, you know, they're not Irish, but they represented so much of what I associate uh, with the Irish in the fire department in New York. And that's my story. I'm going to stick with it. Thank you for paying attention. I'm happy to take any sort of questions. I, I don't know if I'll have the answers, but I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Anybody have any questions? Feel free. I don't didn't get any questions online. So. Just uh, remember, had a friend who was uh, an Albany cop, retired, and uh, he was a, a veteran of the uh, Korean War. And I said to him, how'd you ever become a cop? Well, he said, uh, I got out of service and I went home and I did nothing. My father got really impatient with that. And he said, look, we got to go to the ward leader. You got to get a job somewhere. So he took him up to Dan O'Connell, who was our <laughs> political boss at the time. Introduced himself. O'Connell looked at him. You know, I'm glad you did well in the service and so on. Father tells me he'd like to see you uh, have a job. He says, well, I'm looking at you. You're too small. He says, I can't. He says, he was thinking of being a, a fireman. He says, nah, you're too small. You're not, you're not big enough to be a fireman. You're going to have to be a cop. <laughs> and he became a cop and had a career in it. <laughs> you know, one of the. I remember your comment on yeah. ladder men first. Yes. Engine men, but right. O'Connell, who was born in the 1820s, that was his mind of what a fireman should be. Right. Well, what, I'm just beginning to research uh, some things about Fiorello LaGuardia. Fiorello LaGuardia was five foot three. And I, I believe one of the first things he did was he lowered the height requirements to be a cop and a firefighter. <laughs> As well, he should have, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> There was quite a bit of litigation on that. Yes. Right, right. And obviously, you know, I mean, I don't know, you know, there's a lot of talk uh, about, well, these standards, you know, and are we lowering our standards, so to speak, literally and figuratively, are we not? I remember when, uh, when women first came on the department in the late 1970s, and it was very controversial. I know my father was not happy about it, uh, but it happened. And uh, the, you know, there were lawsuits, there was litigation involved. Uh, but I remember uh, I was just sort of new to covering politics. So it might've been more like the uh, late eighties, I guess might've been because Koch was in his third term. And somebody said to Mayor Koch, you know, well, what, what is your position on, on women firefighters? You know, do you think that they are up to the job? 
And Kasha's remark was, my uh, only uh, qualification for a firefighter uh, is, uh, can that firefighter take a 225 pound mayor and carry him down three stories at Crazy Mansion? <laughs> if you can do that, you got the job. <laughs> Which, when you think about it, yeah, uh, right. Um, but those those tests are rigorous. I know I know very healthy males who fail that test. The smokehouse, where they, you know, that's when that's sort of the, I think it's one of the last parts of the physical. I could be wrong about that, but I know you go into a smokehouse and you're crawling and you can't see anything. And uh, I mean, my brother-in-law uh, did the smokehouse and say, yeah, I'm not doing this. Right, not doing this. Uh, but there were suggestions in the late 70s that uh, maybe they uh, increase the physical demands of the exam to keep women, women off. In fact, that's what the judges decided, that, you, that the FDNY had rigged the test, so to speak, to, uh, to ensure that you know, women couldn't pass, and probably most men too, right? Uh, but then they, they, made the job, they made the test more uh, like, well, okay, you know, do you really have to run a marathon in three hours? I mean, come on, let's make the test more realistic to what the job is all about. And once that happened, you saw more women, although you know the FDNY has probably the fewest percentage of, I don't know this for a fact, don't hold me to it, but the FDNY's percentage of women is pretty darn low you know, uh, compared to other urban departments. It's not a fire bell, folks, don't worry. Yes. My father, my grandfather was a fireman who died in 1927 and left my grandmother as a widow with a 10 year old son. And the fire department, I've always been impressed by this because that was before social security and everything, took care of the widows. Yes. And she was hired as a matron in a firehouse and she'd go every morning and clean up, make the beds and so on. And uh, she did that probably, she was well into her 60s she loved it. She got on that subway from Chelsea, went up to um, 161st Street. She was at the fire house right by the Yankee Stadium. Oh, yeah. That's the where my wife was and born. Yeah. She, um, you know, she was very grateful for that. Yes. I mean, uh, the fire department and the police department in New York, and probably all urban places and suburban as well, you know, I mean, there is a sense of camaraderie. Uh, and, you know, when you lose a brother or sister, you know, you don't forget and you take care of the people. Uh, they left behind. That you know, that is a, a great tradition that that is still that still exists. It's oh, it's it's well, it's more systematic now. I mean, if you if you are uh, a survivor of somebody who dies in the line of duty, uh, first of all, often the, in New York these days, the mayor and city council will promote you so that your pension is a little bit more. I mean, that's happened on numerous occasions, uh, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I think for the most part, the survivors of those who die in the line of duty are very much taken care of. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I used to represent FASME, the uh, Volunteer Fire Association. Yeah. And we had an issue a few years ago involving fire patrols. Yes. Uh, did you come across that in any of your I did, yes. Fire patrols. Uh, well, in New York, the fire patrols were a, uh, an institution that was funded by the insurance companies. Exactly. Right, right. Now they don't exist anymore, I don't think, but I could be wrong about that. They might. The building says they were, they were administered by the Board of Fire Underwriters. Right. Was, uh, repealed in 2010. Right. And they all came out of, they all dissolved out of 2016. Except for one on Staten Island right now, which is private not-for-profit corporation was seeking legislation to recognize uh, that they have more, more authority Yeah, I, I've, seen, I've seen several references in my research uh, of two fire patrols and, and the role that they played, uh, particularly in commercial, you know, when there's commercial building mostly for the most, uh, and uh, speaking of Staten Island, uh, every uh, I, I do teach on Staten Island these days. It's a part-time job. Uh, and uh, when I do, I go on a street called Victory Boulevard, which actually passes on Staten Island, which reputedly is a borough in the city of New York, a volunteer firehouse. 
I believe, you know, that there's one in Garrison Beach, Brooklyn as well. Is, yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's actually at least two, and there might even be a third on Staten Island. Is that right? Yeah. So there's still, a, you know, there's still a few fi volunteer firefighters in these, you know, three or four communities in Southern Brooklyn and Staten Island. Uh, I don't know. I, I know one of the pieces of advice my father gave me too, with all due respect to volunteer firefighters, uh, he said that uh, you know when the time came for me to own a house that I should always uh, live in a jurisdiction that has a paid fire department. And you know I thought, oh okay, well, of course, like uh, don't all jurisdictions have paid firefighters? <laughs> no, they don't. And it's not that you know he had any disrespect for volunteer firefighters at all, but he just felt, and I think I did ask him and he, and again, with all due respect to volunteer firefighters, his view was, we professionals will go into a building to save you and we know how to do it where the volleys may not, which you know, I think is fair enough. I'm sure if there's a volunteer firefighter out there uh, listening somewhere will contradict me. But I think that's probably true. You know, certainly the professionals are trained better, right? A professional journalist, <laughs> presumably, is better at the job than someone who is just sort of sitting in their underwear and writing twi tweets, right? You know, we'd like to think a professional uh, journalist has more skills. We'd like to think. I don't know that he used the term paid firefighter. Yes. <laughs> right. That's right. That's true. Yeah. You're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Any other questions? The, what, the other thing I would tell you too about my research too, I did all my research at the fire museum, the fire department of New York museum, which if you're ever in lower Manhattan, I urge you to go there. And also at the fire academy and library on uh, and Randall's Island, which isn't easy to get to, uh, but oh, they've got great records there. And I could not, I mean, I did this book basically in a year. This book came out September 11th of 2002. So, and I had been working on it a little bit before 9-11, but obviously once 9-11 came, it became a very timely book. Uh, and I had no idea where to turn. I mean, I interviewed some of my father's friends uh, including a couple of my father's friends who were at the, what we call the first bombing of the World Trade Center, remember 1993, yeah. which is a dramatic story too. Uh, when you hear from the firefighters perspective, you realize, oh my God, you know, that, that was really bad. You know, we forget about that now because of what happened on 9-11. Uh, but if you, if you do get the chance to be in Manhattan and you're interested in firefighting, the Firefighters Museum, I, I don't know what their hours are these days and everything is screwed up because of COVID, but it's, it's just a great facility. So we're good? Any other questions? No? All right, let's well, uh, show up everyone online. Okay. Well, so thank you to everybody who joined us online. Um, so and I'm just gonna bring out my dates quick. Um, so, and thank you so much to Terry for joining us. So coming up next, We've got Elizabeth continuing her War of Independence Centenary Series next Monday. And then uh, Dr. James Keneally from Skidmore College will be speaking on Horace Plunkett on Tuesday the 28th. So we hope that you'll be able to join us either in person or virtually for that.